11, verses 20 and 21 and 22. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. May God once again speak to us from his holy word. An elderly man lay dying on his deathbed. Hospice had been called in, and uh, they knew that his time was short. But in a few moments that he had to himself, suddenly up in his room, he smelled the wafting of the favorite cookies that his wife made for him. And in his last moments, despite the, the strength that was, that was draining from him, he rallied his strength and he rolled out of his bed and he crawled to the stairs and made his way down on his butt and he got to the bottom and he was so exhausted he had to stop for a while. And then he crawled on his hands and knees into the kitchen. He couldn't get enough energy to stand up, but he reached his hand up onto the table to get a cookie and his wife took a spatula and smacked it and said, don't you touch those, those are for the funeral. Even though his wife missed the point, for most people, our last moments here on earth are significant. Usually people want to spend the last moments of their lives doing or saying something significant. It may be expressing our feelings to those that we love. It may be involving words of wisdom to help those that we leave behind to carry on. In the case of the patriarchs, it involved proclaiming a blessing that would guide and affect the lives of the children that they loved. Among their last acts, they desired to infuse into the lives of their descendants a sense of God's active presence to guide their future. In the final analysis, they wanted to pass on that relationship with God because that is the one thing that would get them through all else and would ensure eternal significance to their lives. Today, we're going to sneak another look into the book of Hebrews and talk about dying wishes as we consider the legacy that we would want to pass on to those who come after us. And as we prepare to do that, let's bow our heads and our hearts for a word of prayer. Lord, as we come to your word, we pray that you would touch us and fill us here. We pray, Lord, that you would visit us here, not just with your word, but with your presence. For we know that your word is more than just print on a page or words in a book. We know that it's not just histories or rules. Your word is living and active, and by it, you make yourself known to us. By it, you reach deeply into our souls and lift us up. And we pray that you would meet us here in that way. We do pray for the one who teaches that you'd hide him behind the cross. For we've come to this place to see Jesus and him only. And it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. A few weeks ago, we discovered that there's a prevailing sense of hopelessness among the younger generation. 12.6 million people between the ages of 18 and 25 experienced a mental, behavioral, or emotional issue in the last year. That amounts to more than one in three, 36.2% of young adults. 19.5% of teens aged 12 to 17 had a major depressive episode in the past year, two out of 10. 42% of high school students reported feelings of sadness or hopelessness in the past year. 36% of college students have been diagnosed with anxiety, and 30% have been diagnosed with depression. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for teens and young adults between the ages of 10 
and 34 years of age. 13.6% of adults ages 18 to 25 had serious thoughts of suicide in the past year. 22% of high school students reporting having seriously considered suicide in just the past year. 10% of high school students actually attempted suicide in the last year, one out of 10. If these were your children, your grandchildren, and they are, what would you want to tell them? What legacy would you want to leave them, to pass on to them? These kids live in a world that's constantly telling them that they don't measure up. Through technology, they find themselves compared to 8 billion people in every field of interest. And it's overwhelming. It's one thing to be a, a small fish in a big pond, but to find yourself a small fish alone in an endless ocean can be overwhelming. Young people can often feel small and insignificant. They desperately need to know that one person who can keep track of 8 billion people and more. That is the God of the universe and that he loves them and that he died for them. I think I've told you about a time that my church in New, New Hampshire used to attend a Christian conference in Boston. Uh, it was at the Heinz Auditorium. It was a huge gathering, 10,000 Christians all in the same place. They had the world's greatest speakers. They had fantastic praise bands. Uh, one particular year, we had drummed up a lot of people. We had 20 people going from our small church. Uh, we were all going to meet there um, as their pastor. I had some things to do, and I was going to meet them late, so I wasn't sure exactly how I'd connect up to, with them. If you've ever been at an event where there's 10,000 people, uh, you know that when you're looking for a person among those 10,000, uh, you can spend a week and never find them. Um, well, I got there late. And uh, worship was already happening, so, so the lights were dimmed in the crowd, and, you know, the worship band is up on stage, and, and everyone's on their feet singing God's praises. And I walk in, and uh, I'm feeling alone. I, I'm just feeling very isolated. 10,000 people. And I'm thinking, I, I have no one to sit with. I, I don't know where my crowd is. I, I there's no way I'm going to find them. If the lights were all on and I went up and down the rows over and over again, I, I might never find them. But here, lights are, are dim. So I'm, I'm actually having a pity party for myself. I'm really feeling lonely at this point. And I'm like, not just isolated from the church people, but I'm thinking, God, there are 10,000 people here. A crowd that's so vast, I can barely pick out faces. Can you see me in this crowd, or do you just see me as a bl one of the blur of faces? Do you actually know that I'm here? You've got 10,000 people. They all love you. They're all singing your praises. Do I make any difference to you? And I finally decided, well, I'm not going to find my crowd, so I'll just slip into an aisle and find a, a, a seat to stand in front of and just kind of join in worship. And, you know, I'm doing this pity party thing. No sooner do I get in that spot, I feel a hand on my shoulder. And it's one of the guys from my church. He says, Pastor, we've been saving a church for you. Why don't you join us back here? And he didn't know it wasn't just, gee, we've got a seat for you. It was God saying, I see you, dummy. I know you're there. No matter how many there are, I know who you are. I know exactly where you are. This generation needs to know a God who knows them, who loves them who values them. They need to know that God has got them on his social media and he doesn't miss a trick. They need to know a God who has a plan for them and is their hope. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. They need to know. And there's no one better to tell them than you and I. You have lived a long time, and because you've lived a long time, you have a blessing to impart. Your many years validate your faith, for you have seen God's hope manifest itself over the time of your life. 
I just spent a few days at my youngest daughter's wedding and with family. And as couples begin their life together, I believe that the most important thing that we can pass on to them is that they should trust God, first of all, for their personal salvation, and then in their daily living as Lord of their relationship, of their lifestyle, and of their home. Faith passes on a blessing and believes that God will make it happen. Hebrews 11.20 tells us, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Now, if you've read the original story in Genesis 27, you know that this was not exactly a neat and orderly process being carried out with great decorum. In fact, Esau was supposed to get the blessing of the firstborn, but Jacob, his younger twin, with their mother's complicity, deceives Isaac, who's old and blind at this point, into thinking that Jacob was Esau, and so Jacob stole his brother's blessing as he had already taken his birthright. You may ask, can they do that stuff in the Bible? Well, they did. You see, these were real people. If this story had been made up, they probably would have cleaned up those details. But this is just the way it happened. Jacob stole Isaac's blessing. But Isaac doesn't take it back after that when he realizes he blessed the wrong son. See, ancients considered the blessing to have a, well, an almost magical power to, to make what they proclaimed happen. They didn't take them lightly. And in fact, Isaac later affirms his blessing on Jacob before he sends him off to find a wife. The writer of Hebrews leaves out the extra details because that isn't his purpose here to air, air the family's dirty laundry, but, but to focus on the faith of Isaac that is able to see beyond his death and seeks to pass on that covenant relationship and the promises which he himself had received from his father so that they might be fulfilled in his son, Jacob. Jacob receives the blessing and is recognized as the son through whom God's promises would be fulfilled. But again, did he receive the things promised? No, Jacob lived as an alien in the promised land. It didn't belong to him. He was a wanderer. He was a nomad. And then in a time of famine, he and all his family moved to Egypt where his son Joseph ruled as second to Pharaoh himself. They were in dark danger of starving to death in the promised land. They hadn't owned anything there yet. When Jacob died... He still didn't live in the promised land, but he continued to believe God's promises would be fulfilled and that his descendants would realize God's blessing and inherit the land. As the writer of Hebrews says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. That sums up Jacob's life, but he had hope because he had a covenant promise from God to pass on to his children. He would die in the wrong country, but he had hope that went beyond death and even overcame death because the blessing he received, he passed on and it would be fulfilled. By faith, verse 21 tells us, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Perhaps because it, it was because he had received the blessing of the firstborn, which he didn't deserve, even because he was the younger son, that when the time came to bless his grandchildren, Jacob blessed Joseph's younger son with the greater blessing instead of the older one. That's not the way it was supposed to work, but Jacob made it happen that way. Or maybe... Somehow God had given him some supernatural futuristic insight and vision at the time of his death. But Jacob gave the greater blessing to Ephraim, Joseph's younger son, rather than Manasseh, the older. Joseph actually had put Manasseh on Jacob's right knee so he would know to bless the one on the right uh, with the greater blessing than the one on the left. And when he did that, Jacob crossed his hands and he blessed them backwards. Joseph even tried to explain it to him. Father, no, 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 no. This is the older one on your right hand. And Jacob straightens him out. And he says, I know. I know what I'm doing. And he does it anyway. Jacob insisted that he knew what he was doing. And he gave the greater blessing to Ephraim. Ephraim did, in fact, become the greater tribe in Israel. 
As he blessed them, he proclaimed by faith that someday they would return to the land that God had promised to Abraham, their forefather. Again, like his grandfather, Jacob believed the promise of the inheritance, even though they didn't see it fulfilled, even though they owned just a tiny portion of the land, uh, only a place that was big enough to, to bury their dead. They no longer lived anywhere near it, but they knew by faith that God would fulfill his promises and give the land to his people. He believed in something that went beyond even his own death. Likewise, verse 22 tells us, by faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Even though Joseph had spent most of his life in Egypt, he was well established. He could have easily claimed Egypt as his home. He was second in command only to Pharaoh. He was the son of the promise, though, and he looked forward to its fulfillment, to God's promise, to a time when the children of Israel would inherit the promised land. And when that happened, he wanted his bones brought out of Egypt and buried with his fathers in the cave of Machpelah, that tiny portion of land that Abraham owned, bury his dead. <clears throat> if any of Israel's sons might have opted out of God's promise, you'd think it might have been Joseph. I mean, he had made some, something of himself in Egypt. He had success, he had power, he had money, he had fame, but his eyes were set on being a part of God's promise. By faith, he looked forward to a better reward. Like Moses, who came after him, Joseph was very well off in Egypt, could have lived a good life there, but he saw a greater reward in being included as one of God's people and living within God's promises, such that he would reject Egypt as his home and make his home in the Lord. As the writer of Hebrews says about Moses, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, Jacob, even Moses lived by faith according to a promise from God that they would receive a land of their own, an inheritance. But inherent in that promise was a greater promise of an eternal dwelling with God, a promise that we share with them, not because of human lineage, but because of faith in Jesus Christ. If we look closely at the covenant of Abraham, Abraham we find that it was not based on human lineage at all, any more than our promises. By human standards, God's promises would have been passed down along the firstborn, but they were many times passed through a youngest son or an, another son. In reality, in Israel's inheritance was not a matter of law, but of promise and of relationship with God, of relying on God and walking with him. The ultimate reward they sought was in eternity with Christ. As we read in Hebrews eleven fourteen. 14, people who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That promise has motivated countless millions to live in this world as if it were not their home. I'd like to highlight two shining examples. The first is Bill Bright. Bill Bright was the head of uh, um, Campus Crusade for years. Charles Colson wrote a eulogy for the late Bill Bright who headed that Campus Crusade for Christ ministry. His comments reflect the life of faith and hope that looked beyond the grave. This is what Colson wrote about Bill Bright. He writes, over two years ago, Bill was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, a dreadful disease in which the lungs lose their elasticity. Unless the heart gives out first, death is by slow suffocation, one of the most painful ways to die. I met with Bill a couple of years ago in his apartment right after he had been diagnosed. His spirit was upbeat and strong. He said he was ready to meet the Lord. I saw no hint of despair or discouragement, even as he was facing his own death, a likely very hard death. I told him that my friend, Bill Simon, diagnosed with the same disease, died of a heart attack before he reached the final stage. That was the only time I saw Bill waver. That would be good, he said. 
And then he immediately talked about the Lord's will being done. The final stage of Bill's pilgrimage was not easy. But Bill never quit. His wife, Vonette, may have seen moments of anguish and distress, but every visitor, myself included, came away with the same impression. It was uncanny, uncanny, indeed supernatural, that Bill maintained his buoyant spirit with every breath, labored though it was, for the last two and a half years as he battled the disease. I spoke to him a week or so before he died. I called to lift his spirit, but he lifted mine. He told me that these two years had been the most productive in his ministry, that he'd been able to write more, direct more projects, and launch more initiatives than ever before. He kept praising God even as he was gasping for breath. That's hope. That's a legacy to pass on to those who come after you. That's a confidence in God's promises for eternity. It's based in the faith that Jesus died for us and rose from the dead. So death doesn't get the last word. Hope does. When Billy Graham was 88 years old, he was suffering with Parkinson's disease. In January of the year 2000, leaders in Charlotte, North Carolina, invited their favorite son, Billy Graham, to a luncheon in his honor. Billy initially hesitated to accept the invitation because he struggled with the effects of Parkinson's. But Charlotte's leaders said that we don't expect a major address. Just come and let us honor you. So he agreed. After wonderful things were said about him, Dr. Graham stepped up to the rostrum and looked at the crowd. And he said, I'm reminded today of Albert Einstein, the great physicist, who this month has been honored by Time magazine as the man of the century. Einstein was once traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached into his vest pocket and he couldn't find his ticket. So he reached in the other pocket and it wasn't there. So he looked in his briefcase and he couldn't find it. And the conductor finally said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively, and the conductor continued down the aisle, punching everyone's tickets. And as he was ready to move to the next car, he looked back, and there was the great physicist on his hands and knees, still searching everywhere for his ticket. So he rushed back, and he said to him, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. No problem. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. Einstein looked at him, and he said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> Having said that, Billy Graham continued. He said, do you see the suit I'm wearing? It's a brand new suit. My wife, my children, and my grandchildren are telling me that I've gotten a little slovenly in my old age. I used to be a bit more fastidious. So I went out and bought a new suit for this luncheon and one more occasion. You know what that occasion is? This is the suit in which I'll be buried. But when you hear that I'm dead, I don't want you to immediately remember the suit I'm wearing. I want you to remember this. I not only know who I am, I know where I'm going. The dying wishes of the patriarchs was not that their children would receive what they deserved or had a right to legally, but that they would receive a promise based on their relationship with God. In my estimation, there is no greater inheritance that we can pass on to our children or our grandchildren than that they trust in Christ and walk with him. Every parent wants to pass on to their children skills and abilities that will help them to do well in this life. But if this life is all that we have given them, then we have shortchanged them of the greatest of blessings. In The Seven Principles of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey has people plan their own funerals because sometimes the best way to, things, to, to plan things is to start at the end and then way your, work your way backward to how you want to get there. So picture this scene with me. You're very old. Your health is failing. You're in your home, in bed, and hospice care has been called in because 
You all know that you don't have very long to live, and this time no cookies. This one's serious. Your children and your grandchildren have come to see you. They're all standing around your bed. Some had to fly in just to be with you in your last moments here on this earth. You realize that you may be able to rally your strength just briefly to address them. What is the most important thing that you want to pass on to them in that moment? What do you want to say? Why would you wait until then to say it? The Apostle Paul confidently declared in 1 Corinthians 15, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. The most important thing that Paul had received in life, he did not hesitate to pass on to others. Jesus Christ, the greatest legacy of hope that we can pass on to the next generation. For God demonstrates his own love in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ laid down his life, submitting to the cross to bear our sins, to redeem us for himself for eternity. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Therefore, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Take hold of that legacy. Find life in it and share it with others. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your great legacy of love that you have passed on to us, that you have come to us and made yourself known to us, that just as Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Thank you for letting us know you. Thanking, thank you for letting us know of your love for us and the legacy of hope for eternity that you have wrought for us on the cross through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to live in that legacy. Help us to declare it and share it with others with a joyful heart and with confidence, for we know whom we have believed and are persuaded that you are able to guard that which we have entrusted to you for that day. Lord, we pray for those who don't know you. As Bob prayed earlier, that there might be a a new thing, an outpouring of your spirit, that many might come to know you, that many may trust in you to find your promises to be true, to find a right relationship, a right standing with you because of what you've done by sending your son to go to the cross in our place, bearing our sins and bearing the wrath that sin brought, that we might be set free and that we might live with you for eternity. Pray, Lord, that... Any who hear my voice from this day would come to trust in you and recognize that it's as simple as saying, Lord Jesus, I recognize you did die for me because I am a sinner. I want to turn away from sin and I want to live for you. I want to inherit the eternal life and have your spirit come and live in my heart. Lord, help us to be proclaimers of that, to be those who pass on that legacy, that blessing, that you have entrusted to us with joy and with the power of the Holy Spirit. For we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.